So that's slightly um, <coughs> behind what we allow the technology to, to catch up with us. Um, and welcome you all to today's uh, Major Traffic Transport Committee, which obviously is dealing with uh, the recommended budget that we'll send to the Department of Authority Committee tomorrow. If I can just remind all members uh, just to use your microphones uh, when you're contributing to uh, the debate and discussion, I think that would help everyone know that all the gallery in particular. Uh, the first item, obviously, is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies, Colin? Yes, Chair, we've got uh, apologies from Councillor Philbin, Wynne, Roland, Flatley, and McNeil. Okay, I think that accounts for everyone looking around the, uh, the chamber. Second item is declaration of interest, and that's just for me to remind anyone if there is anything that you're aware of now or at any stage during the debates and discussions, please make sure that you uh, declare accordingly. Third item is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, and can I uh, move that the minutes uh, from the meeting on the 4th of January um, are approved as an accurate record with the additional points on the chair's note? Is that agreed? Sign those off accordingly. And the fourth item is obviously the emerging tunnel totals 2018-2019. And Gary's going to. Uh, oh, Ron. Travel available to customers. 
section 3.19 to 3.22, along with the supporting appendices, helps to show members the current details of, of actual tunnel usage, including fast tag usage and the trends associated with such. The key point again to stress here with this information is the ongoing annual usage increase of the tunnels, the increasing use of fast tags, now at 55%, of all payment methods and the concentration of those fast tag users in the city region. In line with the city region made or pledge, the report looks to introduce a new level of toll and off peak charge, reducing fast tag to one pound for class one vehicles on an off peak basis. For the clarity as stated in the report, off peak is between 7 pm of an evening and 7 am the next morning each day. Monday through to Saturday and all day for Sunday. The report also recommends the continued concessions of free travel <coughs> for all vehicles on Christmas Day and free travel for livery and emergency service vehicles which the organisation has supported in previous years. So, in line with the recommendations within section 2 of the report and the specific tolls in the, in the table identified on se in section 2C, at the top of page 16, the recommended tolls are there for members to consider and obviously to sign up. I'm happy to take any questions in respect of the report. Lovely, thanks for that, Gary. Um, before we move on to motion recommendations, <coughs> things of that nature, I want to take people's comments on the report. Any questions about the people, Gary? So, comments from first. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I've got a question from Gary, but I've got a couple of comments I'd like to make. Can I, first of all, welcome the reduction in the past time? austerity uh, we've been able to as Gary explained uh, not increase the tolls for four years uh, but clearly clearly there are new dynamics in this report which is sort of groundbreaking for us in, in, a, in a way we've had the ability to look at in a more flexible approach to how we toll where we toll and at what level we toll so I think there's so much good news in this report um, you could have a balanced view in your own mind that the temporary increase on ca on the cash could be well mitigated by uh, really, really good news in the report. And I think it's worth just reminding that in the absence of any other funder or any other organisation such as government taking the, this into the road network and paying through national taxation, then we are the beholders of the responsibility uh, and running of this tunnel. You'll see later in the budget report that in the capital programme there will be some £10 million uh, forecast to be spent on the maintenance of the tunnel in its forthcoming year. And when our forefathers created this tunnel and the second tunnel, it was to enhance the economic growth of the region. It was to make that link between the will uh, and the wider city region a continuous one. Without help from government, without help from others, they did it amongst themselves. They actually other boroughs who may, you know, seem to feel they get less out of the tunnel and the tolls and everything that goes with it, actually come together as a Liverpool city region, uh, as it were, and fund this, this on, on a regular basis. 
the worst thing that can happen is that responsibility that's been handed to us is not used properly in terms of keeping them safe and keeping them moving <coughs> at all times because the closure of one, either or both of the tunnels will be an unmitigated economic disaster uh, for all the local authorities and the Liverpool city region. So, so we don't take this responsibility lightly. Uh, we, we do it responsibly and we do it with all the other issues in the back of our minds. So I believe the off-peak uh, it is groundbreaking. It has delivered on one of the uh, election promises by the Metro Mayor, and it, it, he did make it a statement that he would aim towards that. And every year we look at the tunnel tolls uh, and we look at the way we run all our operations, and I think this is a progressive report, only with the proviso for whatever reason uh, we are making the fast tag more economic, easier to use. The migration to the fast tag is a progress at the rate that I believe it would and would solve many of the questions or many of the objections that have been raised. Simply moving to the fast tag will automatically make you a 60p for journey saving and it is easy to do. I spoke to a colleague in work yesterday who did it whilst sitting at his computer. He can load it up, he puts a £10 direct debit in every month. If he doesn't spend that money, he can retrieve the money at a later date. It is that easy to do. I don't know whether people are aware of the ease of it and what what is the possibilities. However, however, with all that in, in, in balance, this is more uniquely felt now when in, in charge of it for the Riddle members. Uh, and in keeping, I think, with um, Ron's, Ron's thinking, this would have been, for me, the perfect report without the extra 10p. And I've I've saw my conscience because I am also a lead member for finance uh, and strategy and I think I think on balance I'm going to support the will line which is there to be opposed. The second thing I am shocked and amazed at through you chair, no disrespect to, to Les Rollins as an individual, this is a big will issue and I know there may be debates about issues later on. But I am informed, reliably informed, that Councillor Les Rowlands has not attended today due to the fact he is on holiday. Now, you can have your holidays any time of the year, and as a will representative, I do hope Mr. Brace's camera focuses on, well, it's not an empty chair, I think they put a coat over it to make people think he might be coming later on. I don't know what's going on, but to take, it, take leave of absence, when will uh, an issue Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, just, I, I'm allowed to speak. Without this I, I would have assumed, and I, I'm not going to presume what, what debates take, up, take place later on. I have the greatest regard for Les, but I think if you time in your holidays, and this has been in Canada for a very, very long time, when we do this, and Les has been around an awful long time, to not be actually be here to vote on, on, on the crucial issue, I think it, you know, it, it's for him to answer, and not for me. It's for me to make comment because I'm not allowed to do so. However, um, all in all, I think it's a generally positive move in the right direction, apart from the 10 p increase, which I, I will take leave to possibly to probably go to against. Thank you. Alan, you wanted to raise a point? Yeah, just to point forward out on and the point you raised about the court on the chair. It has got nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that if we are trying to disguise the fact that less is not here. I have put that. I have put the court on the chair because I didn't want it creasing because of my ample body leaning on it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. okay. We could have mimicked that I've, I've got news for you. I've got a ton of lava on the chair, but we, 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 we won't go to, into that. That's a, perhaps a big sour on the sun lounge is probably not a great Thank you, Chair. Uh, in the spirit of... Uh, Full transparency, I'll, I'll admit that I am also a fast tag owner. Uh, I've got one question and one comment about the report. Um, I was actually quite surprised to see that 53.97% of um, payments are made by fast tag. It's a higher proportion than I would have guessed. Um, you've normally got one lane for fast tag. I wonder if, given that there's that many payments, if you go to two lanes, and that would also be an additional incentive, especially at peak time when that would be the queue is quite short for fast tag. It's something we, we monitor and manage on a dynamic basis and, and even this morning as an example I drove through the work to the last tag lanes in operation coming into Liverpool. There will be a decision that's made, don't forget all the other lanes are available for fast tag usage as well. 
all the auto lanes along the Tech Fast Tag. So it is around just a dynamic decision that we based on looking at traffic levels and the approach of traffic and the congestion at that time. But it is something that we regularly introduce in our most recent toll refresh as well, the facilitated access the ability to move to three fast tag lanes on each bars and in each direction. So we do recognise the increased issues from starting to prepare for that. Thanks, I forgot that you could use that everyone. I'm going to be using policy to Absolute clarity, the fast tag can be used as a payment in any one of our toll lanes, including the staff. And I think one of the things we need to do to, to pick Steve's point up is just make people more aware of that. That's some of the things we're planning in the most recent information. Thank, thanks for that. Just on my, my wider comment is that obviously this new um, pricing structure with an off peak um, reduction is presumably in response to the Metro Mayor pledge to reduce. Uh, fast tag toll and in his pledge he did make two sort of promises one that he'd reduce fast tag to a pound and the other that that would have an effect of improving air quality i do think that these uh, changes aren't going to achieve either of those the reduction will be seen as an under delivery uh, by people who were looking for a uh, lower price to cross the river and i don't see that there's enough within this pricing structure to actually have any positive impact on air quality um, I was thinking it might have had a better impact on air quality if the peak times were better defined. So around about rush hour, so around about the 9 o'clock mark and the 5 o'clock mark. And then during the middle of the day, it could be uh, reduced to offset an increased fee um, at the rush hour peak times. Uh, that could have been done in a revenue, revenue neutral <coughs> way. And that could have had the impact of actually getting people to shift modes and choose different forms of transport. Unfortunately, that opportunity hasn't been taken here. Um, and more broadly, I do think that uh, road pricing can be uh, an effective way to try to tackle things like congestion and air quality. Um, we've seen with the London congestion charge, um, that's been very successful. <coughs> Obviously, air quality is still bad in London, but I'm sure it'll be a lot worse without the congestion charge. Um, and so I think maybe it's now the time to look at the possibility of a clean air zone across the whole of the city region. It's not just the will, the will we feel um, unfairly treated by having to pay to come to Liverpool and now Holton as well, of course, um, where all vehicles entering into Liverpool would have to pay some kind of charge. This would hopefully reduce the overnight traffic in Liverpool, enabling Liverpool to address its air quality issues. I think that would be fairer to all the boroughs in the city region and uh, it would give us a lot of money that would be raised to invest in public transport, walking and cycling. And just one other comment on the report as a whole. It's, in, in its projections, it predicts a 1% growth in usage in the year. So, in a way, it's acknowledging that the changes are still going to lead to a growing number of cars driving into Liverpool city centre every day. So, um, I think it's predicting growth. I think, therefore, it's going to have a continued uh, harmful impact on their quality. For that reason, I will be supporting the Thank you. Yes, a good report, but the problem we just opened the 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 bridge with a strong car. This is a and this is a toll on that, as we all know. So there are several people, maybe some in this room, are not happy with that toll. If we support this motion, then we are saying, well, we don't really mind increasing the tunnel charges, but some of us perhaps are not happy with the, the bridge <coughs> charges. So therefore, people that support this motion here and then, then say no to the at all on the legal in this front on bridge are perhaps saying it in a little bit of a, hypo a hypocritical way. I don't know. I will not support uh, this report. Thank you. I'm not sure, Charles. Uh, all I would say that that would be racist in the response is conservative government is insisting on tolls on the new bridge. Oh, yeah. So um, if we're talking about hypocrisy, I think we need to speak to your government on that issue, actually. Wrong. Yeah, 
ground information, the peak hour or the peak to the dimension tunnels are between 7 and 10 in the morning and between 4 and 7 in the night. The same that 9 o'clock is the peak hours. Not that should be right. The volume of traffic decreases when we have these in towns and it's starting to talk about that. But one thing I just like to also to reiterate, we as an organization, before the combined authority was formed, and since the combined authority was formed, have consistently asked this conservative government to take the tunnels into the national road network. And each time we've asked that question, they come back with an affirmative, no, get on with it. The legislation is in setting, setting stone, and that's what we have to find by. And that's unfortunately the legislation we have to find by. And that's why every year we have to consider this issue around tunnel tolls and the appropriate amount of it to charge for a tunnel toll. It's put onus on, on us as local politicians. I think it's an unfair onus that the government should have rectified some seven years, eight years ago, and they haven't done that. And that's the issue we've been dealing with, is you know, the lack of, of affirmative from the government that says, everything you want to do, fund it yourself. It's the same thing now with, under the austerity. They're saying anything you need to do, put your council tax up to cover social services, cover this, cover that, cover everything else. We're not giving you the money, we're taking it away from you. And that's all this conservative government does, is to take, 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 there's nothing back to the world, the economy and community. And that's why we're forced to make decisions like this. I'm not comfortable sitting here making decisions that increases the burden on people. And I'm sure everybody else is not comfortable doing that. And I think that's a fact of life that we are. But we are pressurised into doing it by this government. And I'll let that bear me on the same as many things. That's what we are. And it should be placed. So, I think <coughs> Chair, yeah, we've uh, discussed this matter now, and we've already heard the people who made their mind up on how to our votes when we come to that vote. And there's a question we put now, we'll take it more, Chair. Okay, well, if there's no further comments, because I was going to say, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Chair, for obviously, before we move to, to that, just to sort of sum up from, from my perspective and reflect some of the comments that have been made, I think this is an excellent book. Gary, I commend you and all the officers and, and everyone who's been involved in pulling this together. I think there's some really good proposals in here. I particularly support the off-peak fast tag that's been proposed for a pound. I think that's a good move in the right direction to fulfil one of Steve Robbins' pledges. I think actually it's important that we start looking at different ways in which we can oversee the tolls regime that hopefully helps smooth our traffic. But from a social imperative, I actually think about the shift worker that has to travel in the middle of the night when as much as we would like to see a more better public transport network through at this moment in time, that isn't there, and that gives real respite and benefit to those people that do, as part of their jobs and as part of their lives, have to be travelling through the middle of uh, the night. Obviously, I'm pleased with the fact that over the past few years, we've done a lot to make sure that the majority of tunnel users are fast tag users, and I will equally declare that I pay for a fast tag as well. And I think we need to keep on in that way to make sure as many people locally are benefiting from a fast tag usage, and it's great that this proposal again is recommended a freeze for the majority of users in the fast time. But one of the things that we always have to bear in mind is that uh, what we do on the tunnels is part of a wider integrated transport network and frankly part of an integrated budget setting process. So because of that, as challenging it is and as unfortunate as it can be, a 10 pence increase in cash users I think is proportionate to make sure that we can continue to pay off the debt, there is still part of the mortgage outstanding, we have fund the operation and the maintenance of the tunnels, but also with the surplus that is generated, put it back into the public transport network for those people that can't afford to use a car frankly and need that additional uh, assistance. So that's my kind of uh, summing up of those points. I know that Alan wants to move a motion. I'm, I'm already <coughs>
ends up with an RP event to do that. And the third one is the budgetary element is not being accounted for. One five, one five, one five, one five. What I'm saying is that this, this, if you call it, if you call it a motion, that's going to be pretty loose in the way that that motion is written. But it's not actually a viable motion to put forth to this committee. And I like the legal response and the financial response to that. The motion was submitted and was duly seconded. But as Council Rowlands is here today, the motion has been considered in advance as required by the Constitution by the Head of Paid Service and myself on behalf of the Monitoring Officer. The County Emergency Side Act, as amended by the Tolls Act, does require the combined authority to set a toll level in accordance with the legislation. This committee is required by the combined authority to make recommendations in this regard. This committee cannot agree to scrap the tunnels as this is contrary to legislation. So this motion, as it currently stands, is not capable of being considered. So that falls. So with that in mind, we can move the question this falls. And can I make move the recommendation in paragraph two of the report so I can see those in favour?
So the revenue impact is quite significantly challenging, but also the, the capital program is once again under significant pressure to jump up to. Merchant travel will continue to improve, will have to continue to improve its efficiency through better processes, better commissioning, and better procurement. All the things that have been done thus far to deliver on those savings and that strategy. And that's been done in order to insulate whatever possible front facing services from these revenue reductions as much as possible. But there also needs to be an acknowledgement, as there has been in previous years, that even our front facing services need to deliver the best outcomes for less resources deployed. Um, across a number of service areas and policy areas, we need to look to ensure that resources are deployed effectively and we continually <coughs> challenge ourselves to ensure that services and policies remain relevant and appropriate. And that's really the function of, of Mercer Travel as the Transport Executive and the Transport Committee's function will be to oversee that and ensure that, that you're comfortable with, with, with the outcomes of that process. But where there are more cost-effective methods of service delivery, then clearly as an organisation we need to consider these carefully. As members are all too aware, the challenge of an ageing population on particularly the concessionary travel scheme in its current guise is, is really significant. It becomes an increasing part of the transport levy every year. But the benefits and the social benefits of that scheme are absolutely critical to the um, the city region economy and we need to find a way of maintaining the benefits of that scheme while finding a sustainable model to fund it uh, as demand increases and revenue falls and I think that's something that the Command Authority and the Transport Committee have, have asked us to have a look at over the coming year um, although just to underline that there are no changes in policy within the, um, within the budget for next year. Similarly, we'll need to maintain watchfulness over the support of bus network and continue with the policy that we've had of increasing the commercial footprint across the city region, which will allow us to reduce public subsidies wherever possible. That's been a really key part of our financial strategy uh, and the additional powers associated with the Merle Combined Authority and devolution of bus should be really instrumental in helping us follow that through. Again, the Mersey Ferries, and a continued financial challenge, and while demand as a visitor attraction is robust, the reliability of what are increasingly becoming um, heritage vessels is becoming difficult to sustain uh, as, a, as a business model. <coughs> Work is ongoing to commission new vessel capacity, which is badly needed, um, to allow us to continue this service for the next generation of passengers. But as ever, financing this will bring some difficult choices. This new investment going to be undertaken as part of that longer term ferry strategy. So we've tried wherever possible to maintain revenue activities, but the capital program has also had to be reprioritized and rescheduled in a number of areas. Having said that, this is the biggest capital program that Mersey Travel Transport Committee, the CA, has ever been involved in, particularly for transport. I mean, it, it, the, the scale of it is incredibly significant. <coughs> Rolling stock obviously forms the biggest part of it. Next year is a critical year for the rolling stock project. It's progressing strongly. We will move from where we are now, which is an advanced stage of design, into production next year. The works around the renewal of the depot are underway, and Network Rail are also about to commence the work on the power upgrade. So, in terms of the project itself, it's a really chunky year next year. But we've also got the little station. Halton Curve and the Cool Station all scheduled for completion next year, as well as other larger schemes. Um, we will continue to do, as was already alluded to, the health and safety critical works and sound asset management works that we need to do on the tunnels, which we've already mentioned. That will always take priority. Um, we, we need to invest in the tunnels infrastructure clearly for all the reasons that we've just discussed. A new toll system will be in place during next year as well. Um, and we'll also be able to invest in other enabling technologies, particularly around ticketing, where we've been able to find resources for it. But increasingly, Mersey Travel will have to adapt to an environment where the capital program is determined largely by the availability of third party funding for specific projects. We've already changed our focus. You know, it's not that long ago where the capital program would have been. Um, Myriad perhaps of smaller scale interventions. Um, 
across a range of service areas. Now we see is much fewer uh, projects of a much larger value, uh, much more strategic, I'd say, will be funded from third parties from elsewhere, including the combined authority. And much of this funding will come from, or as a direct result of devolution and the elected mayor, uh, the city's infrastructure funding of 125 million isn't reflected in this budget because we're at an early stage of that, but over the next three years, delivering that will be a real challenge for the organisation, but clearly an exciting one. Mersey Shore will also be pivotal to, pivotal to delivering other elements of the Metro Mersey agenda, in particular the best use of those renewable powers in respect to the bus economy, and looking at investigating the benefits of station devolution. This budget clearly deals with Mersey travel, just make reference to Halton. The arrangements for Halton will be the same as in the previous year, whereby a differential level will apply, and that will be determined tomorrow by the combined authority after consideration with Halton. Halton will continue to be responsible for transport delivery within its own boundaries while work continues on future integration of services wherever that's possible. So in summary, next year's budget will again be challenging, but we believe that what's been proposed is a responsible budget. We, Mercy Travel as an organisation, will need to focus further on efficiency and prioritisation of resources. Uh, however, resources do remain available to deliver around those key corporate priorities and to deliver those critical programmes of work that are needed to support transport and the wider economy and the new Metro Mer and the devolution deal, all of which have had to be accommodated within, within this paper and within this budget. So that's all I wanted to say at the moment. More than happy to answer questions um, on, on this. Thanks, John. And I've got rather Steve. <coughs> Tom. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I once again thank John for uh, on what I want so for a, a comprehensive report. And once again, I know I didn't release really the balance of budget, uh, especially with your studies and the Some of the issues I'd just like to raise, based as an organisation, a number of challenges. Uh, and the contract and changing in the future. Um, that's the mode of travel, travel we are. But I think it's, it's just been mindful some of the things that we do do. And, and John's alluded to the heavy travel. The government funded element of the bus has not been increased. And I know there's been huge pressure on the government to increase that amount, from, especially from the shire uh, around the country, but that have lost huge elements of their bus service. In some areas of the, of the, of within the, the, the country now don't have bus service. I know the pressure is now being felt across all the, all the areas and all regions around the, the pressures on the concession travel due to the, the fact that the, the numbers are going up, but the money doesn't go up. And I'm nothing surprising with this government is they bring something in and say, that's it, get on with it. Uh, so I think we just need to be mindful that these things are happening. And that about balancing the budget uh, and I understand you know we cherish our concessionary travel and it's something we should try and protect but there is real pressures on it um, and we need to understand that we need to work out how the best way to deliver that given the fact is that we are you know, decreasing what we should be looking at as well as an organisation is there are other opportunities for revenue generation and that's where we need to build I think everybody has to look at that now. Uh, you can't just expect, well, in fact, there's no grants from the government, so you can't expect government grants. So you have to seek out what funding you can. And obviously, the, fund, the money we get from the authorities have been frozen, but as you quite rightly pointed out, inflation <coughs> puts pressure on it, uh, demand puts pressure, puts pressure on the budget, and it's about balancing what we've got. Uh, it's the old McCorber system, isn't it? You've got one pound, one shilling, you're rich. We got all the 99 pence is broken, bankrupt. So it's that scenario of trying to manage the thing. But I think it's, we should be looking at what are the options we've got as an organisation to bring revenue into this organisation that supplements the things that we need to be doing. And that takes some pressure on us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first, we can uh, thank the officers for the clarity of the report and the readability. And, uh, you know, in the past on this organisation we've had, uh, as you referred to, possibly uh, reams and reams of paper that 
uh, hit the true story. This is very easy to read, very understandable where the money's going. Uh, none of the uh, items of expenditure are things we would not like to do. Um, but we have to make quite clear to everyone that this is an austerity budget in austerity Britain, run by an austerity government that has waged war on local governments and local transport authorities across the country um, uh, from, from the way it go. We are actually in a position where we're actually celebrating a budget freeze. This is a, it, the irony of it all, that we're celebrating a freeze in our budget when actually that in itself causes problems. Because to stand still, as you all know, with all, all the pressures on, you, you, your legs have to work a lot harder, a bit like the swan on, on, on the pond. Um, and that's what this organisation has been doing. <coughs> and we will be making savings throughout the year uh, to maintain just that simple level. But it does appear as though the message has got through that we have been hammered. And we, uh, as a constituent authority, again, on behalf of Will, I'm sure to speak on behalf of all the others, those savings that we made at this centre and the reduction in the levy has enabled us to do things or make less hard choices back at our own individual authorities. So, so we have made a major contribution to the, the life and soul. I just want to refer back, uh, obviously the early debate is done and dusted and I support entirely the, the majority vote of that and that now makes the, 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 the budget exactly what it is. But I'm minded, and I, I, paid, I did pay some, uh, well, <coughs> credit to the Mersing Tunnel Users Association, who are organised, who are able to lobby, able to get, get things on the agenda, and able to actually get you know, numbers of emails to us. I actually look at the, the reports, and because it's an austerity budget, we are having to make tough decisions on support of bus fares, for example, which in their own right went up 10p. Um, but no, we don't get the bombardment of, of emails, we don't get that organisation. I often think, as a socialist, that's where the world is wrong. Those who can organise and, and may have money to do so, or, or have uh, a certain one little issue to, to deal on, and a lot of our, our residents get left behind. So it's just puts that in stark comparison that this budget isn't doing any favours to a lot of people across the transport network, but it's maintaining what it's probably, I believe, in terms of our concession fair, and all the other things, one of the best run transport authorities across the country uh, and, and groundbreaking in its own right. So I'm quite happy to move this budget and refer again to Appendix B. And those people say that the tunnels uh, you know, can, can be free or whatever they want to make up stories. There is £10 million in the capital programme in this one year alone under Appendix B to actually keep these things running and improve their safety uh, and the way we run them. So, so that in the round, yeah, you know, what I can say now is, as lead member for finance, this is a, a, a job well done, but work begins. The minute we pass this budget, work begins in achieving the targets for next year. Uh, and I uh, hope the, the local combined authority accept this in the round. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, John, for the report. Um, I'll sort of echo the previous comments, but it's encouraging that even despite the large budget reductions, we're seeing quite an ambitious capital programme still doing a lot, of, um, a lot of things that will benefit the region in the long term, so that's really positive. Um, a couple of questions. Um, obviously, one of the sticking points is going to be the 10p increase to the supported bus service fares. Um, I just wondered, when, when was the last uh, increase made? bus service fares and how much was that? So that was one of my questions. And the other one was, um, I'm looking through the capital uh, plans for the Mersey tunnels and the leaky feeder system replacement, I can't work the terminology right for that. That doesn't appear on that. Is that being dropped as an ambition? Or um, does that come up onto another type of initial call? John, do you want to pick that up or share what you might want to do? 